Hello and thank you for joining us for our Wednesday night Bible class as we continue our study of the book of Lamentations. We'll be in chapter 2 tonight. Again, all of our classes are still for Wednesday night and for Sunday are online right now as we continue to abide by the regulations in our state and the guidelines we've been given. So thank you for clicking on this video and continuing to study with us. The book of Lamentations is a tough book to read. But it's also proven to be a really good study and a timely one for us. As we look at a nation that weeps, certainly we can look around in our own nation today and and see some similarities there. A nation that looks at its own lifestyle and, and hear the prophet Jeremiah weeps over what he sees. And we can look around and weep at what we see going on in our country. And there is this great contrast in chapter 2. Everything is about where Israel used to be and where they are now. And, you know, if you live long enough, you can't help but do that contrast a little bit. You can remember back and say, you know what, growing up in the 80s or the 90s, this is what we did and now here is. And maybe there's a sense of nostalgia sometimes of, oh, I miss the good old days. And other times it's not nostalgia at all. It's just thankful that you survived that and you don't ever have to wear those clothes again or do your hair quite that way again. And You look back, but there's a contrast. Jeremiah looks back and said, here's what Israel was supposed to be. Here's what God intended. And then he looks and he said, and here's where we ended up. And so as we move through chapter 2, you're going to hear an awful lot of contrast. And we'll kind of try to point out Jeremiah sees some different things that they have lost. Lamentations is a book of poetry, and we've mentioned before we study that just a little bit differently It's written a little differently, and so while we'll move through this verse by verse, we're going to look at some themes that we see, and we'll analyze the pictures that Jeremiah gives us. Lamentations chapter 2, remember this is an alphabetical acrostic poem, and so if you were reading this through in Hebrew, these triplets, every one of the triplets would begin with the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet. That's why there's 22 verses in in chapter 2 because there's 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. It begins in verse 1, How the Lord has covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger. He has cast down from heaven to the earth the beauty of Israel and did not remember his footstool in the day of his anger. And and again, it begins with that same question that chapter 1 did. How? And if you've ever looked around and wondered, how could this happen? How did we get here? That's exactly what starts out here how could this happen and then there's a a loss of guidance how the Lord has covered the daughter of Zion with a cloud in his anger for the Jews that cloud represented so much and a good Jew that knew their history would would go back and say you know what I, I remember in the Exodus when God led his people and that cloud was a symbol of God's protection and direction And that cloud came down between them and the Egyptians and protected them while they crossed the Red Sea. It was that cloud that was a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night that led them through the desert. When it lifted up, they packed up camp. When it stopped, they made camp. And here is this cloud, instead of being a cloud of protection and direction, it is now a cloud of gloom that that covers his people. It says he has cast down from heaven to the earth the beauty of Israel and did not remember his footstool in the day of his anger. Jeremiah says, you know, we used to be the beauty of God. We used to be the the footstool, kind of that idea that we served God. And now he's cast us down. He's forgotten us. He didn't remember all of that. The phrase did not remember uh, likely points to that mercy, or his footstool likely points to that mercy seat. There on the Ark of the Covenant, that that was where God met with man. And Jeremiah said, you know what, we we sinned so badly that that God said, I'm not going to remember that covenant we made anymore. Verse 2 said, the Lord has swallowed up and has not pitied all the dwelling places of Jacob. He has thrown down in his wrath the strongholds of the daughter of Judah. He has brought them down to the ground. And Jeremiah is very clear that God is behind all of this. And while Jeremiah weeps over this, and while the nation of Israel weeps over what they see, not once does anybody accuse God of being unjust in bringing this judgment. And so he says, here's all the dwelling places, all the different things, and God has thrown down in his wrath the strongholds of the daughter of Judah, brought them down to the ground. The things that used to be high are now low. And he said, the Lord has swallowed up. 
That, that idea of being swallowed up, it, it really carries the idea of a quickness or a suddenness. It, it was everything's fine and then whoop, it's all gone. The Lord has swallowed us up and there was no pity, no mercy at this point. And instead, God has thrown down in his wrath the strongholds, brought them down to the ground. He profaned the kingdom and his princes. God looked at them and literally he desecrated, he polluted them. God defiles or profanes his inheritance by giving it over to Babylon. And as Jeremiah saw the destruction that the Babylonians brought on Israel, he mourned for the loss of their place with God. Verse 3 says he's cut off in fierce anger every horn of Israel. He's drawn back his right hand from before the enemy. He is blazed against Jacob like a flaming fire, devouring all around. Everything that was around them has been consumed. This is total destruction. The idea of a horn in Jewish imagery was always a symbol of strength. And so every symbol of strength, every horn of Israel has been cut off. And God consumed Israel and everything around them. He devoured everything. Verse 4 says, Standing like an enemy, he has bent his bow. With his right hand like an adversary, he has slain all who were pleasing to his eye. On the tent of the daughter of Zion, he has poured out his fury like fire. There's a loss of status. We used to be the apple of his eye. That's what Psalm 17 verse 8 says of Israel, that they were the apple of God's eye. And now all who were pleasing to his eye... He's slain them all. And now those who, who counted on God as a friend, now he stands like an enemy. Those who were protected by his right hand, now God has withdrawn that right hand. And so they look at what life is like as an enemy of God. Verse 5 said, The Lord was like an enemy. He swallowed up Israel. He swallowed up all her palaces. He's destroyed her strongholds. He has increased mourning and lamentation in the daughter of Judah. Jeremiah looks around and, and he just says, Everywhere I see, it's sadness. It's nothing but sadness. God has increased mourning and lamentation because God has become the enemy of those who he had originally called his friend. And so you see the judgment of God and what it's like to be on the wrong side of God. And, you know, Judah had enjoyed for so long that status of being on the right side of God, and now they have crossed over because of their sin, and they've lost everything verse 6 says he's done violence to his temple as if it were a garden he's destroyed his place of assembly the lord has caused the appointed feasts and sabbaths to be forgotten in zion in his burning indignation he has spurned the king and the priest they lost their temple the babylonians came in and destroyed the physical temple but it was so much more than that it represented their connection to god and Jeremiah said he's done violence to the tabernacle as if it was a garden. You know, every spring when it's time to plant the garden, you take the tiller out and you just tear it all up and you turn all that dirt over. And that's kind of what Jeremiah says God did to the tabernacle. He just tore it all up and reduced it back down to the ground that it had been built on. The attack was ferocious and it destroyed the place of assembly where God had said here's where I'll meet with you here is where I want worship to take place God has become so disgusted by their sin that he allows the temple to be destroyed and so Jeremiah looks out and he says you know what when the temple was gone the the feasts and the sabbaths all the signs of our worship they're forgotten it wasn't that the people didn't do them anymore it's that they they couldn't anymore and so they began to forget in his burning indignation, God had spurned the king and the priest, both the, the civil government and the religious government. God had rejected them all. God would allow his people to, to follow their false prophets no longer. And so God had rejected the king and the priest. Verse 7, the Lord has spurned his altar. He's abandoned his sanctuary. He's given up the walls of her palaces into the hands of the enemy. They have made a noise in the house of the Lord as on the day of a set feast. And so God looks, at, or Jeremiah looks, at, and he sees the wall, and he says, you know what? The, the wall is lamenting here, the wall of the city. And the Lord has purposed, verse 8, to destroy the wall of the daughter of Zion. He stretched out a line. He's not withdrawn his hand from destroying. Therefore he caused the rampart and wall to lament. They languished together. Jeremiah looks and he says, you know what, the temple has been abandoned. God spurned his altar. He abandoned his sanctuary. The, the Babylonians came in. They didn't know how to worship God. They just made a racket. They made noise 
in the house of the Lord. And the wall that watched it all, the wall that was broken, the wall cried out. The ramparts, those were the def- those defensive structures, they lamented. They languished together. Verse 9 says, Her gates have sunk into the ground. He's destroyed and broken her bars. Again, the idea here is that everything they trusted in, everything that they would have said, look at how great Jerusalem is, look at how we can withstand any attack, it's all gone, it's all destroyed. The gates are gone, the wall is gone, the temple is gone, the kings and the, the king and the priests are gone. Everything has languished together. Everything has been destroyed and broken. Verse 9 continues, Her king and her princes are among the nations. The law is no more, and her prophets find no vision from the Lord. There was a loss of the law. The kings and the princes were God's appointed rulers. They're gone. And so Jeremiah looks and he says, Her king and her princes, they're they're out among the nations. They're not at home where they should be. They're not the king and the princes of Jerusalem. They've been captured and taken out. He says, The law is no more. God's law with the destruction of the temple, they could not keep the law. They couldn't keep those feasts. But it's more than that. With with their sin and the judgment for their sin becoming complete, the law is just gone from among God's people. No one followed it anymore. Without the authorities who mediated the law, its effect was no longer present, and so God removed it from them. And her prophets find no vision from the Lord. God no longer spoke. They didn't want to hear, and at some point God said, I respect your decision. And so he stopped speaking, and her prophets find no vision from the Lord. Verse 10 says, The elders of the daughter of Zion sit on the ground and keep silence. Those who were leaders, those who were supposed to give advice, they they just sit in total shocked silence. They throw dust on their heads and gird themselves with sackcloth. Again, that's the, the dress of one who is in mourning. Such an act might have been an expression of repentance, but there's no indication of that. It simply means they're sorry this is happening, but not sorry for what they did. They had a sorrow, kind of like Judas's sorrow in the New Testament, where he regretted what he did, but there was no repentance there. There was no reformation of life. And the verse continues, and it says, The virgins of Jerusalem bow their heads to the ground. The writer says, "Here, Here is the young women. And they are in complete submission to the enemy. And it's almost as if as Jeremiah writes this, he stops for a moment to just be personal. And so he says in verse 11, My my eyes fail with tears, my heart is troubled, my bile is poured out on the ground because of the destruction of the daughter of my people, because the children and the infants faint in the street of the city. They say to the mothers, where is grain and wine? As they swoon like the wounded in the streets of the city, as their life is poured out, in their mother's bosom. Jeremiah looks around and his own pain just bubbles to the surface. And we see that Jeremiah loves these people. He doesn't get any joy from bringing this. It's why the book is called Lamentations. Jeremiah weeps for his people and weeps for what he sees happening. He says, my eyes fail with tears. I've cried so much I can't see straight. My heart is troubled and literally the word troubled there is the word kamar. It means to scorch or to burn. My, my heart is left desolate. My heart is scorched. He poured out his heart. He was overflowing with hurt, but he's helpless because of the destruction of the daughter of my people. And he goes on and he specifically looks at the children. And he said, you know, this hits the children hard and that's not fair. He says, here are the little ones. And they say to their mothers, where's grain and wine? We're hungry and we're thirsty. They swoon like the wounded in the streets of the city as their life is poured out in their mother's bosom. Jeremiah pictures these small children suffering and they just lean up against their mothers and they cry and there's nothing to be done. The helplessness that Jeremiah feels is such that it just makes him weep even harder. Verse 13, he says, How shall I console you? To what shall I liken you, O daughter of Jerusalem? What shall I compare with you that I may comfort you? O virgin daughter of Zion, for your ruin is spread wide as the sea. Who can heal you? As deep as this pain is, it goes even deeper when he sees the children paying a price. And then Jeremiah says, this is just, it's beyond comprehension. To what shall, or how shall I console you? What do I say? I don't know what to say. There's no words left to say. Jeremiah says, I I can't warn you it's happening now. I can't encourage and exhort you because there's nothing good to encourage and exhort and build up. 
And he said, as I look around, all I see is ruin. Your ruin is spread as wide as the sea. Jeremiah said, it's like looking out at the ocean. You can't see the end of it. He looks at the destruction. And he says, it's as unlimited and as unfathomable as the ocean itself. And Jeremiah says, here's the cause of it. Verse 14. Your prophets have seen for you faults and deceptive visions. They have not uncovered your iniquity to bring back your captives, but have envisioned for you false prophecies and delusions. There are three charges that Jeremiah brings against the prophets who spoke. And we know from Jeremiah's other book, the book of Jeremiah, that he had run-ins with these false prophets on a regular basis. And he says, here is the loss of truth. Look at how Israel used to be a people of truth, and now there's no truth. There's a loss of truth. Your prophets have seen for you false and deceptive visions. The word false emphasizes that their visions were evil. The word deceptive there literally is the word for tasteless or unsalted, it can mean. There was nothing to them. They were empty. They were meaningless. They were false in that they were evil. They were deceptive in that they looked like there was something there, but nothing actually was delivered. You know, lots of people pursue paths that are evil. Lots of people pursue paths in life that are false and deceptive. They're unsatisfying to themselves and to God. But God in his truth offers us a better way. Jeremiah says, your prophets have seen false and deceptive visions. He says, they have not uncovered your iniquity. The role of the prophet was to say, this is wrong. You need to fix that. Can you imagine a doctor who comes to you and you got some bad test results? He said, but I don't want to hurt your feelings, so I'm just not going to tell you about it. No, the first thing is to admit the problem. And, and Jeremiah says, your prophets didn't admit the problem. Instead, they, they had never uncovered. They covered over your iniquity. They did not expose it. In God's eyes, this is a time for blunt truth. A time to do something about a problem. And the prophets sadly had failed so spectacularly that many people didn't even know there was a problem. Because the prophets had failed to warn them. The prophets had failed to teach the truth and warn the nation. And then he says, to bring back your captives. God acknowledges the captivity that is happening, that will happen. From the fourth year of King Jehoiakim all the way up until Israel is destroyed some 18 years later, Jeremiah struggles because he sees these deportations where the king of Babylon comes and takes more and more people. And he says, the captives will never be brought back. The prophets are not going to do what they can do to bring the prophets back. While lying prophets hope for a quick return, Jeremiah says this is a long problem and it will be a long solution. And in verse 15, all who pass by clap their hands at you. They hiss and shake their heads at the daughter of Jerusalem. Is this the city that's called the perfection of beauty, the joy of the whole earth? The truth is, those, those, that, that idea of the city of Jerusalem, it, it was the perfection of beauty. This was everything that God had hoped for. This was his people, his shining people. And yet it wasn't anymore. And so Jeremiah looks and he says, here's folks who pass by. These are folks that don't care. They walk and they look and they, they comment. It says they hiss and shake their heads. You, you can almost imagine they cluck their tongues. Oh, tisk tisk tisk. It's terrible what happened to Jerusalem. And, and so the folks who are unconcerned, they're foreigners. They're astonished at what happens. But that's it. But then verse 15 all your enemies have opened their mouth against you. They hiss and gnash their teeth. They say, we've swallowed her up. Surely this is the day we've waited for. We've found it. We've seen it. So now you have those who don't care. And now you have those who are active enemies. And both of them walk by. And they are, they are excited. The enemies are. They're excited to see Jerusalem fail. They say, we've swallowed her up. We've consumed her. The amazing thing to me is that Judah has become an object of analysis. Nobody stops to care. Nobody stops to weep with those who weep. Instead, they stop and they cock their head and they, oh, tis, tis, tisk, And, well, you know, this is what went wrong. And this, they've missed the pain. And the enemies can only see the judgment of God and they've missed the pain. In fact, it says that they had kind of waited to see this. They were hopeful to see this. It is tempting sometimes when we see people suffer to just sit back and analyze. And Jeremiah feels the, the wound deeply by those who stepped back to just analyze instead of actually caring. And he says, whether you were those who passed by or whether you were their enemies, 
if you didn't stop to care, if you didn't stop to see what was going on, or worse yet, if you just mocked them, hey, didn't they say this was the perfect city, the perfection of beauty, the joy of the earth? The enemy said, we've swallowed her up. We, we've opened our mouths against you. They, they've hissed and gnashed their teeth. They say, we've won. We've found it. We've seen it. And then in verse 17, Jeremiah says, now wait, before you acknowledge what they've said, you need to know the Lord has done what he purposed. He has fulfilled his word, which he commanded in the days of old. He is thrown down and is not pitied. He has caused an enemy to rejoice over you. He has exalted the horn of your adversaries. Jeremiah says, you know what? God has done this. This is not something that the enemies of the Lord did. The Lord has swallowed us up, he said back in verse 2. And here he says, the Lord has done what he purposed. He had a plan. And as much as he didn't like it, this was part of the plan. If Israel left his will, there was a punishment set in place. From the very beginning, God had warned Israel that there would be consequences to these actions. And now he says here, God has done exactly what he promised. And the idea there is also kind of a reference to a predictive prophecy. When God looks ahead and he gives some specific details to show that he's God and no one else can do what he does. He, he makes this prediction with some degree of exactness, some 800 years before it happens. God is the true author of the Bible. God is the one who, who knows what's going on. And Jeremiah said, you know what, God, you knew exactly what was going on. You commanded this in the days of old. Again, this isn't some knee-jerk reaction from God. This is simply him delivering on his promise Verse 18 says, Their heart cried out to the Lord, O wall of the daughter Zion, let, it, let tears run down like a, river day, like a river day and night. Give yourself no relief. Give your eyes no rest. And the mood might be even reminiscent of the night that Christ was in the garden. As he prayed that night, and his tears fell such that the sweat drops were like blood. And here you see, as Jeremiah looks, he says their heart cried out. There was a heartfelt cry to God. We, we don't see any repentance yet, but they did cry out and say, Ouch, this hurts. We don't like this punishment. And Jeremiah again personifies the wall around the city. And he said, Here the wall weeps. The wall cries day and night. There's no relief for any of this. Twelve times we've seen... In, in this lamentation already, Jeremiah has used the daughter of Zion as a, a metaphor for all of Judah. And then he personifies the wall as crying out. And, and we're, we're impressed in, in a negative way, but we're impressed. The wall was this strong structure. The wall was their last line of defense. The wall was what they trusted in. And here is the wall weeping. Here is the wall crying out in the night. And Jeremiah goes on, and he says in verse 19, Arise, cry out in the night at the beginning of the watches. Pour out your hearts like water before the face of the Lord. Lift your hands toward him for the life of your young children who faint from hunger at the head of every street. Now Jeremiah looks, and he says there's a need for the people to pour their hearts out. There's a need for the people to come back. It's not enough to, to, to say, I, I hate this, it hurts. There has to be a changing of heart. So he says, pour out your heart before the face of the Lord. Seek the presence of the Lord. Uh, the prophet can't erase what they've done, but he says, here's your pathway back to God. Here's how you can return to the glory that you want ha once had. And he said, here's how your little ones can look toward a better future for the life of your young children who faint from hunger. God says, I, I want you to turn back. I, I want you to come back to me. Verse 20, Jeremiah says, See, O Lord, and consider, to whom have you done this? Should the women eat their offspring, the children they have cuddled? Should the priest and prophet be slain in the sanctuary of the Lord? Young and old lie on the ground in the streets. My virgins and my young men have fallen by the, by the sword. You have slain them in the day of your anger. You have slaughtered and not pitied. Jeremiah looks and he just sees carnage everywhere. He, he looks at, and Jeremiah is seeing the, the scene of what it would look like after Babylon conquered all of Jerusalem. And, and he said it, it's terrible. It's awful. He said, as I look at it, things that should never be done have been done. Whether it's uh, women eating their offspring, and you see that in Scripture, and what a horrible picture that is. He says, the priest and the prophet are slain. Uh, those who, who were God's people 
are killed and they, they're left in the street. They're not even given a proper funeral. Young and old, they lie on the ground in the streets. Virgins and young men, they've fallen by the sword. And Jeremiah says, you have slain them in the day of your anger. You've slaughtered and not pitied. Jeremiah prays that, that God would see the streets strewn this way and that God would have some mercy he said, you haven't had any mercy. This judgment, it's fair, it's just, but what we need is mercy. And no one has escaped your judgment. Verse 22, he says, you have invited us to a feast, as to a feast day, the terrors that surround me. In the day of the Lord's anger, there was no refuge or refugee or survivor. Those whom I have borne and brought up, my enemies, have destroyed. God said, I, or Jeremiah says, God, I want you to see there's terrors on every side. Everywhere we look, it's horrible. And it's almost like you've invited them all to come eat with us, to have a feast day together, everything that we're afraid of. And he said, God, you're angry with us, and there's, there's no refugee, there's no survivor. There's no getting through this without you. God's anger is complete. His discipline is severe. And Jeremiah says, there's no refugee or survivor, those whom I have born and brought up, my enemies have destroyed. You begin to see how Jeremiah feels about the people. Here's the people I've been preaching to. God, I, I feel like they're my people. I feel like I've borne them and brought them up. He says, I love them, but my enemies have destroyed them, and God, you allowed it. Jeremiah looks out and he sees this, this great disaster, and he knows in his heart that it's a result of Israel's sin. That they left God, and this is simply the natural consequences of leaving God. But as Jeremiah sees up close and personal the consequences of sin, he is horrified by it, and he cries out for mercy again. So as we look, we're going to see in chapter 3, Jeremiah continues this anguish, but there's also hope because he looks to God. As much as he looks at the people and says, you've disappointed God, you've sinned, you've walked away from him, he looks at God and he says, you never leave us. You never forsake us. And there is a great blessing in that. We'll pick up in chapter 3 next week looking at Lamentations. I urge you to, to read ahead, to take a look at that, and to wrestle with it. This is some hard stuff. It's some deep verses. And we need to wrestle with that. But we need to feel that pain. And certainly as we look at our own world, there's a pain that we feel for everything that's going on now. And we weep with those who weep, we mourn with those who are in mourning. And as we look out, even sometimes we may grieve for our world when it doesn't grieve for itself. As we see how far they've come from the ideal, that contrast between what God intended and where we've ended up is hard for us to miss as Christians as well. Let's pray as we close today. Oh God, our Father, you're good to us. But God, you are also holy and righteous you have given us standards and you have told us how to conduct ourselves you've told us how to be your people and god we pray that you'll help us to do that god we're thankful for your love and your mercy and your grace but we're also thankful for your discipline that guides us back into the path you would have us to be so god we pray as we have studied today in this book of lamentations we, we look and we pray that we'll look into our own hearts that we'll see the, the ravages of sin. We pray that we'll look into our communities around us and that you would give us open eyes to see the pain that sin has caused, to see those people who have left you, departed from your word, those people who are far from you, and that we could reach out to them with the hope of the gospel message. And God, as much as we are touched by the pain of sin, we are impressed again with the value of your gospel, the love that you've shown. Thank you for sending Jesus to this earth. And God, for all these things, we give you the praise and the honor and the glory. And we ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.